Thank you for being here this evening. Um, as I've always wanted to be Dr. Ruth, <laughs> let's talk about sex. I mean, let's talk about sex in your work. Um, <laughs> that's the perfect answer. Uh, why, why do you think in our Western and supposedly open culture, sex in art still seems to disturb people? We've always campaigned for a day when sexuality is a question of nil, that we don't have divisions or divisiveness, that there is no gay or straight or this or that. It's just that everyone is a sexual person. Uh, uh, it's quite interesting because if you go through the antique uh, museums, you, know, you see full of sex, don't you think? Like medieval times, just full of all the Romans or the, uh, the Greeks, they are just all big erections full of all the stuff. <laughs> and now when you come up to 2001, we are all shy about, about sex. And we are all hiding it. And especially, okay, maybe you can do some painting nudes. You know? Painting you can, but when you have them photographically in a museum, it's taboo. Do you think this has changed at all during your 40 plus years of working together? Has it gotten, um, has it gotten more difficult to portray um, nudity, sexuality, or has it seemed no, think, to... No, I think we've made enormous progress. The whole world has changed enormously in the last 40 years. And I think we like to think we've played a small part in that change. What about all the advertising on the streets? You know? They used to be so old fashioned. Now they all, what do you call, they look like all the queers on the street. <laughs> I, I, think, I think you're right. Let's go, <laughs> let, let, let's take a step back if we could. And for those of the members of our audience who don't know your history, um, it would be great to learn a little bit about how you met and how you began working together and also how the whole concept of living sculpture came about. It's fairly simple because we met in London in 1967 as students at St. Martin's School of Art and when we left we were completely alone. We were without a studio, without money, we were very poor and we hadn't been the goody-goody students who could get a part-time teaching job. <laughs> We certainly couldn't ask for a grant from the Arts Council, which is what all the other students did. So there we were alone in the world without a studio, and we felt in that moment that we were the art. We were living the art. Not only that, because when I arrived in England, and uh, I couldn't speak very good English, so George seems to be the only person who was interested in me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. In, in language lessons. Yeah, I know. We, we, sign language was a lot to do with. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it was quite extraordinary because in 1967, he, we used to, instead of actually making art, we used to walk London day and night. And he took me to the, these extraordinary places like East End of London that really looked like a Dickens book. It was just fantastic, all this yellow light on all these narrow streets, and that's where George used to live already in 1964. And in 68, you, we moved to number to Fournier Street, where we are still. And then we had two enormous pieces of luck. Again, we always believe that bad luck leads to good luck. And there was the occasion of a very famous international traveling exhibition, group show, called When Attitude Becomes Form. And when it arrived in a city, a local curator was asked to add to the show three or four artists from that city. And we knew it was coming to the ICA in London, and we knew the selector was going to be Charles Harrison, a very famous person who knew us, and knew our art, and so we were extremely happy. We thought, here's our chance to launch ourselves into the world of art. And then to our amazement, he didn't choose us. <laughs> so we were plunged into an enormous doom and depression, and then we thought, what can we do about this? We can't exhibit in this famous exhibition. And then we thought, well, we can go as living sculptures to the opening. So we had our multicolored, metalized heads and hands. We went to the private view. We stood in the middle of the ICA and entirely stole the show. <laughs> and at the end of the evening, probably the most famous European art dealer of his, of his time, Conrad Fischer, came up to us and said, I am Conrad Fischer. You do something with me in Dusseldorf, huh? I can just hear the voice. 
And it was quite exciting because in 1969, when we left St. Martin's School of Art, every day we wanted to be artists, but we didn't have a studio. So we used to send out all these uh, what postal sculptures, and we used to do magazine sculptures that we did, the Gilbert the Shit in George the Count in 1969, and we took, it, took that magazine sculpture to all the galleries of London, if they would show it for one afternoon. And everybody said no, except except, uh, what's his name? Uh, Robert Fraser. Robert Fraser, who used to be the most famous art dealer at that time. And he said, yes. <laughs> Did he keep it for more than an afternoon? No, it was just the afternoon, but that's all we wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other extraordinary piece of luck was doing the singing sculpture in a small, very unimportant gallery in Brussels. And at the end of the evening, a lady who we thought at that time was a very old lady, which she was been younger than us now, came up to us and said... Much. Yes. Said, my name is Ileana Sonnebend, and I'm opening a gallery in New York, and I want you to do the opening exhibition. And we knew her just from the name in magazines, as art students who look at all the advertisements in the art magazines. So there was an enormous opportunity. It was the beginning of downtown, West Broadway, 420 West Broadway. We remember the day, it, the Saturday it opened, the, the pundits were saying, mm, it's quite an interesting idea, it'll probably catch on in a few years. It caught on that day. The whole of Soho was filled with people. The police department were called out, the fire department was called out. It and was very exciting. It was very exciting because we came like, the, like some innocent boys to New York, and so we were taken out by all these artists. This was extraordinary. Like Russian so was friendly cooking to for us. us and all this stuff. So friendly towards us. And we started to drink every single night. No? And during the day, we used to do the singing scalpel for eight hours nonstop. In the uh, seven, or eight o'clock in the evening, started drinking for four, five, six, seven hours. <laughs> every day, it was extraordinary. One day, George was vomiting that side, <laughs> but we still were going on nonstop. <laughs> we especially chose different dishes for dinner so we could check whose is the vomit in the next <laughs> And, and amazingly, at that time, as well as the singing sculpture, we also showed the general jungle, much of which is on show in your rotunda now. And we brought that in ourselves, all folded up in a big box. And the customs people opened the box and took an enormous interest. They liked it. Oh, they just, <laughs> this is beautiful. Did they open it up entirely? Yeah, they opened up a big page and they said, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's great. And they thought, they thought it was some treasure, some valuable thing. And then they said, who did it? And we said, we did it. They said, oh, get out of here. <laughs> I want to go back for a moment to Conrad Fisher, because I know you have a wonderful story about him as it relates to the motto, the theme of uh, art for all, that has really become almost an identity for your work for so many years. Yeah, it's very funny, because we do art for all, we started in 1968, the idea of art for all. But at that time, art for all was not for for the elitist galleries. They didn't like the idea of art for all because they thought they were making art for only very, only some few people who <coughs> pretended to understand it. So it was a very early exhibition with Conrad in the tunnel gallery and we had a wonderful evening. I think they even sold one or two pictures, which were amazed and excited by it. And we had a lovely dinner and party. everyone was very, very happy. And then the next morning we went into the gallery and there was Conrad sitting at his desk with the telephone there, looking, looking rather down in the mouth. And we said, do you have a hangover? Conrad, no, no. He's still looking. So we were determined to find out what was wrong. And said, what is wrong? Why are you looking so miserable? He said, the woman who comes to clean, she likes your exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and, and that's, that's, that's how, the story. That's how the art world was. Yeah? The kiss of death. If, yeah. you, if you did color, it was wrong. If you did sensuality was wrong, so if you did feelings it was wrong. It had to be a square or a circle or a line. That's how we began the drinking sculptures, because we were going out every night when we were socially involved in the artists and getting completely crazy and dancing and everything. And we realized that all the other artists were going to the studio the next day and just doing a perfect circle. So we thought, let's involve the drinking in our art because it's such a big subject all over the world with the law, with families, with hospitals, with death, with everything. It is a subject. That's how, that's how we started. But with all that drinking, it would be hard to draw a perfect circle. Yeah, yeah. Well, we had, but we, we didn't want to draw it. practice. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't want to draw, draw a perfect circle. Going back to when you were students for a moment, when you were at St. Martin's, 
uh, were there specific artists who you admire the work that they were doing then or even earlier artists? Mm. I don't he think I've ever talked to you about that. Gibbard always said he was inspired by... I mean, when I was 14, or 13, 14 years old, I saw Michelangelo as my, what do you call, father. In Georgia, he had a different idea, no? Yeah, I always thought, though, because as a teenager, I bought a second-hand copy of The Letters of Van Gogh. And the one thing I saw in reading was that you could do everything wrong, yeah? have the wrong <laughs> family, the wrong training, everything, and get it right. Just make amazing <laughs> pictures. That at this moment, somewhere in the world, somebody's looking at those pictures and having extraordinary emotions. And did you visit museums at that point? Yes, a little. But we're trying to... Not a lot, but yeah. I mean, we didn't like so much to look at other, people, other people's art. We, already at that time, we felt that we wanted to be outsiders. George always had this idea that he wanted to be a super tramp, no? <laughs> I think he succeeded in some way. <laughs> but uh, it's very good because after that, no? Five, uh, five years, ten years later, we started actually never to go near a, a gallery. We stopped going to galleries, stopped going to museums, because we didn't want to be contaminated. <laughs> and do you think that worked? Oh, it works. hundred percent. hundred percent. No, we need a lot of space in front of us for our brains and our feelings. So if you cut out all the thinking that you're involved with, if you're socially involved with people and parties, and it's, it's much better to be alone and weird and normal. Weird is important. <laughs> but it's very important even when we are in the studio, you know, we, know, we never want to, anybody to see our pictures before they are finished. I've, are, known, I've known you for 35 years. I've never, I've never seen them. No, because Maybe we only show late. them when it is too yeah. late. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And even because when somebody comes into the studio, they will say, oh, I like that red one. That's already too much. They're already contaminated us, no? Because they really feel we have to do the opposite now, immediately. Uh, along that subject, um, there are so many of us who have admired your work for so long, but know very little except what we've read about your life, about your day-to-day -day routine, about, and even how that's changed over the years that you've lived on Fournier Street uh, because of the changing conditions in the neighborhood, um, all those uh, neighbors um, and restaurants and even your tailors who have changed over the years. Could you tell us a little we, bit about day to day of Gilbert and George? We, we like change. We're very organized and very regimental in the, in the studio, in our lives. We dine at the same time, we have breakfast at the same time. But we like the ongoing throb of the changes around us. We like seeing life. We never, we believe that everything is progress. Everything that changes is progress. Every time we look out the window, something different. We, we've seen when we first moved to the district, it was Yiddish speaking. The off license was Jewish. The restaurants, the cafes were Jewish. Every, everything was Jewish. Then it became very briefly uh, Somali. They all came in, very tall. They were very old with filed teeth at that time. Extraordinary. And then it became Maltese for a while, and then Bengal Maltese, Maltese yeah. even playing cards all day with ferrets and Alsatian dogs, extraordinary. And we've seen the synagogue become a mosque. We've seen the Jewish off license become a Bengali uh, music shop. All, all the shops have changed in their way. E yeah. Even even the gents' public lavatory on Whitechapel has become an Indian restaurant. Some <laughs> some, some, some young friends were recommending it to us. They said it's delicious food. The service is very good. And it's eating or takeaway. I said it always was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a, I always love to walk with you on Brick Lane or anywhere in your neighborhood. Everyone recognizes you. I mean, there's everyone is so friendly. Does that is that persisted to today, or has that changed yes, somewhat? No, that has not changed. It's very interesting because our greatest fortune was that in Fournier Street there used to be the Market Cafe. Huh? And Clyde and Philip, they were these, what do you call these, elder, elder gentlemen who had this cafe there. It was just extraordinary because he started cooking at 12 o'clock at night. And so we would, go, we would be there at 6 o'clock in the morning and we could have a roast beef sandwich completely fresh. And unbelievable, he was a genius, that person. He's the only genius we ever met. And uh, here, yeah, <laughs> except us. But, <laughs> but, uh, but so he, what do you call he 
he stopped, and now we have to find different places. They are not as good as that. But uh, the district is just fantastic because everybody knows us, and nobody troubles us. Nobody. George that goes every night, he does one and a half hour walk every single night. I do a 45 minute walk, and we exactly at 8 o'clock, boing, we are in the, the restaurant. Tell me, tell us about your tailoring. Tell, because I know so much about that from years past, but tell us a little bit about... so many. How, it's a big long chain. It was Mr. Simons first, and then it was Mr. Chaplin, then it was Mr. Lievenberg, then it was... I Mr. Lustig, Mr. our Lustig. neighbor. And then it was uh, David London. This is the last suit made by David London, and we'll have to find another tailor. There won't be any more Jewish tailors anymore. We Where have, have they gone? They've, they've, well, we said to the, the tailors, why, why didn't your children take it? They have teenage children who do tailoring. And the tailor said, what do you call the son of a Jewish tailor? A brain surgeon. <laughs> um, the, 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 the earlier tailor, the tailor's an extraordinary thing as well, because they, they were always rather elderly, so they would retire and sell us to the next tailor. who's also quite elderly, yeah? And they were always very keen to, to get the order for the suit, because then they would get the payment from the, the last tailor. Yeah? And one was retiring, we said, that's a disaster, what are we going to do? He said, don't worry, he says, I'm not retiring entirely, I'm going to be in Israel with my daughter for six months of the year, and then I'll be back in London for six months, and I'll be able to do your tailoring. I said, that's marvellous, do tailoring in London, and then you'll be tailoring in Israel properly. He said, are you crazy, you can't do business with those people? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you only walk halfway with, with ah, George? Because I have flat feet. That's it. <laughs> I should have, I should have known. There is always a reason. The, um, I wanted to ask a little bit. We talked a little bit about the changes around Fournier Street. But what else has changed? What has been very important to you about how, how there's the change in London overall, and especially in the East End? I must admit personally, we more and more, I would say we put on blinkers. We don't, we don't see a lot. Because we are in our studio all the time now. We're becoming more possessed now. More possessed? Much more possessed, totally mad. So every day we have to be at seven o'clock in the morning in the studio working like, like I don't know, possessive people. And like last year we did 153 new works. Not and one day off, not even the Sabbath. The, I wanted to ask um, a question about, to again, help some of the members of our audience and others coming to see the show, um, that there's often a debate, or at least a discussion, about what your art is. Um, many of us for years have called it sculpture. Um, others have called it photography, and we know very well that you're certainly not photographers um, in any sense of the word. But how, in helping our audience, how would you describe what you do? Pictures. Big We're pictures. artists and we make pictures. Very simple. Yeah. Okay. People would understand that anywhere in the world. Yes, it's pictures. Nice, nice and That's democratic it. and simple. Like the simple. Renaissance. They did pictures, we are doing pictures. That's it. And we are speaking through pictures. They are frozen pictures. A number, a number of um, people have said, and this is, I'm not making an ageist statement here because we're all about the same age, um, that you've been called, in a sense, uh, the fathers of the YBAs, of the young British artists. Uh, many of them look up to you. Uh, some of them acknowledge the impact that you've had on the change in audience perception in London and all over Europe, all over Asia. Um, do you see any of that new work actually having come out of what you've been doing for so many years? We're not what, sure what about do, that. We're, what do we call ourselves? Yes, I'll, I'll get to that. Because yeah. I, I think we're very supportive of young artists. I think every country needs more and more artists. There aren't enough artists in the world anyway. You have to remember that in the early 70s, when we were baby artists, if you ask people on the streets of London to name a, an artist, they would always say Leonardo da Vinci or Van Gogh, or always, always be a dead overseas person. Now if you ask, <laughs> yes, dead, a dead foreigner. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 
And now if you ask the name of a living artist, they all know four or five or six names of artists, even people who work in cafes. And I think that's better. You, you don't need to know just the names of living politicians, murderers, and sports people. <laughs> in that order? <laughs> the, the, um, well, yeah, but we, don't, we, we wouldn't say that we were the fathers or godfathers of the artists. Maybe, maybe the fairy godmothers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, we we uh, waved the wand. <laughs> yes. Um, speaking about um, how people um, now recognize, well, certainly know your names in London, there is a great story that I heard, but I want you to tell it and verify it, about a conversation that took place in a cab between some American collectors. I and know, you continue I hope, I hope it's the same one. <clears throat> uh, uh, some families of American collectors came to London, separate from different cities, to see a show of ours at White Cube. So they met in a London hotel and then traveled in a taxi to the East End. Well, in the taxi, they were discussing which pictures of ours they owned and which ones they were reserving and which ones they would like to have got and couldn't get. So one lady was saying, I wanted to buy shit on piss, but I could only get spunk on blood. And the other one said, I wanted spunk on blood, but I ended up with piss on tears. <laughs> and then they realized that the very nice London cabbie was listening. So the lady leaned forward and said, excuse me, young man, I hope you don't think we're vulgar Americans swearing back here. We're discussing contemporary artworks. And the driver said, oh, it must be that Gilbert Johnson, I suppose. <laughs> That's and a, I can verify, without mentioning all the titles of your work, I can verify that every cab driver, especially the older cab drivers in London, um, when I've said I'm coming to Fournier Street, they said, oh, you must be visiting Gilbert and George. Oh, it's true. Or, it's absolutely, absolutely true. The one, one point, and part of the exhibition upstairs, which makes a very important point, are all of the early paper sculptures, um, General Jungle especially. and. It depicts nature um, in a way that hasn't really continued in your work beyond mm -hmm. the beyond the 70s. Yes, Maybe. Uh, what about nature? How I mean, that... nature was very simple because we were lonely people, so we used to walk the parks of London. And so we were very innocent. We took images of us in the park. We saw the idyllic life, and then. We had these shows in Düsseldorf, no? and we sold one of these drawing pieces for 1,000 pounds. And we were so shocked that we were drunk for two years. <laughs> that's why we changed that everything. Up. That's it. And we changed totally from that. That's it. We did a drinking sub, and we never looked back. That's why we never redid them. Because and I think we, coming from the country, we were both country boys, and we didn't know how to except being in the city. We weren't familiar with newspapers. We never watched television. So we could only express ourselves through what we knew. Yeah? It took us a long time through the, like Gilbert said, through drinking and meeting people to become city people. Yeah? In fact, we, we forgot nature and our backgrounds in that way. And one day we said, let's go and see some friends in the country in North, North Devon. And we went down and we saw this nature for the first time in 30 years and we were amazed. We got up early in the morning and there was no traffic. You could literally hear insects buzzing in the hedges as we walked up the village high street. And there were birds swooping down on the estuary and we thought this is unbelievable. Ideally. So perfect, ideally. And then we came to the little parish church and outside the parish church was a very young couple with a little baby in a pram. And the church with all the tombstones and the flowers. And we thought it was absolutely paradise. And we turned to the couple and said, good morning. And the young man turned and snarled, fuck off, you weird-looking cunts. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's why we left the country. Now we got it. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I, I, I can come up with another uh, question there <laughs> after that. Um, I, I would like just to ask one other question, uh, not about so much your art, but your very great collectors, which I think oh, yeah. people <clears throat> don't know. And although once in a while in catalogs of your work, you're shown in Fournier Street with 
some of your collections. Would you talk about that? Ah, uh, it's very simply because in 1979 we stopped going to the cinema. We decided it was too expensive. In so, 1979. Nine. Nine. So we started. We we had a certain interest in collecting in looking looking at 19th century furniture and all vases and books. So we on Sunday every Sunday we used to go and look in, through the windows of the shops. And the day after, we used to buy them immediately on Monday morning. So we started to collect so much and spent all our money for six years, absolutely every penny that we ever had. And this, this, this is thousand, thousand, we have 2,000 or 3,000 vases. You know? We have like uh, sideboards, like 30, 40 sideboards. <laughs> and we, have, we have books. We have, George has a Huge special libraries. dirty collection of maybe 20,000 books. So we are doing very well. And uh, <laughs> because we are going to arrange a foundation. I was just going to ask yeah. you that. Because so, so, so that our collections, our art, and the, the two Forney Street houses and the studios will remain there? Because we have every design of every artwork that we ever did. Even the designs of all the catalogs that we ever did. We have everything there. Even we have the articles, the first article going back in 69. So we have the f and every negative, and even social photographs, and art from different people even we have. And we even have a very big collection of our own art. And so it's quite an interesting idea. We and talked about the fact that there are no 20th century or 21st century artists' houses in London. There are very few. In fact, none. In London, there isn't one. If they even moved the Bacon studio to Ireland. Yeah? So I think in that one century in the bit, it's quite good to have a, an artist's house open to the public. Yeah? So you will be able to see the rooms where we, where we are sleeping, standing up. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone believes that, actually. It's true. <laughs> the, um, let me take just a few moments that we have left and invite any questions that we might have from the audience. We, we don't believe that we are a collaboration. We never accept to be in group exhibitions called collaborations. We believe we are, as Arnold said, we are two people but one artist. So we're not working together, we're working as, as one. It's a mystery to us as well, I must say. <laughs> No, we believe that uh, Andy and pop artists in general were a celebration of consumerism, and we want to be a celebration of humanism. Well, well spotted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Stop, Emma. But uh, because we always say that all the what you call art world was always written by what you call the art world meant naked naked ladies for the last two thousand years every artist did naked ladies because the man had the checkbook and the man wanted to look naked lady and we thought we should do something different once to change the balance a little yeah? it's still a fact today that we have a pair of Edwardian oil portraits of the husband with a nice army jacket on and suit, and the other portrait is the lady with the bowl of flowers, the wife. The, the lady one will always have a higher price. That's why we're feminists. <laughs> <laughs> Their next show will be in our feminist galleries. <laughs> I was trying to decide what would be appropriate as a little gift, a token for, for Gilbert and George in coming to Brooklyn. And so... I hope not pajamas. Uh, no, <laughs> we're not talking about that. The, and so um, I went to the heart of Brooklyn, the Fulton Mall, and we've got these hoodies. What could be more Brooklyn than Gilbert and George at the Brooklyn Museum? America. So one, one for each. Um, in keeping with your tailoring. Very good. And when I come to London the next time. No, just in front. Very good. Come on.
I think we like uh, we love the hoodies. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> it's going to be an entirely different world.